guys, welcome back. This is episode number 96 of Match Hat, featuring part two of my interview with Paul Ritchie and Fred Ford, the designers of Star Control, one of the greatest games of the DOS era. In this part of the interview, we talk about Freefall Associates, uh, the formation of Toys for Bob, Archon, and of course, the game you've been waiting to hear more about, Star Control. This is some great stuff, got a lot to cover. So without further ado, here is Paul Ritchie and Fred Ford. Let's talk a little bit about Freefall Associates. <clears throat> you know, how did you get a how did you get involved with them? Freefall starts with John Freeman and Ann Westfall. Uh, and John Freeman uh, has a, a long and interesting history. Um, he's been in science fiction since it virtually began. He attended fairs or you know conventions. He wrote uh, some novels, and then he wrote uh, for Playboy publications, the um, Playboy's Guide to Games. And so that connected him with a, with a programmer guy whose name I forget to form Automated Simulations, which was one of the first two or three game companies in existence. And they did uh, Battle Fleet Orion and Starship Orion. Um, and then that led on eventually to them becoming Epics. And they did, you know, the Temple of Apshai and Hellfire Warrior. And I met them when they were showing off their, gosh, I think it was their pet version of Temple of Apshai, and they had a booth at a D&D convention next to Errol and my booth, and we just started talking. And I had programmed at Lawrence Hall of Science, and I may have outrageously overstated my abilities, but also John didn't have any experience in paper games, and so he was fascinated by everything that I knew about paper games, and I was really interested in computers. And so uh, he hired me to do a follow-up to Hellfire Warrior. And so I sat, I think, in front of a TRS-80 for about three weeks, 20 hours a day, entering this, this game built within the Hellfire Warrior system. And then there was a grand falling apart at Epics between John and his partner. And so at that point, we split off with Ann Westfall, his wife, and a great programmer, and formed uh, uh, with Robert Leyland, uh, also an Epic dude, um, Freefall Associates. And we had a famous list of 12 games, and we were shopping them around, and this strange little company called Arctronics was being founded. Um, we went to a party of theirs where they had arcade games and food and drink, and it was like the first big, serious business party I'd ever been to. And they had their manifesto printed by the door, and we're just like, wow, this is, this is weird and different and kind of scary. But anyway, it turned out to be Tripp's company, and uh, we... Signed up, uh, Murder on the Zendernef and Archon were uh, some of the first games they contracted. And I think, actually, Murder on the Zendernef was number one. And so we did those uh, for a few months. And, and I made money and was staggeringly, overwhelmingly seeing my future uh, as how much money I was going to make. Because Archon took about three or four months. And dot, day for day was probably the most successful days I've ever had. But, um, and then after that, uh, we did a sequel to Archon. Um, and I sort of wanted to head off and, and make different kinds of games. And one of my coworkers at TSR Hobbies, Evan Robinson, uh, and uh, his wife, Nikki Robinson, who had just graduated from Santa Cruz, wanted to program games. So they had done a port of Picnic Paranoia for Synapse Software, and uh, based upon their knowledge of, of the Atari 800 and the Commodore 64, I had wanted to make this game... Loosely speaking, b building battling beasties, I think is what someone called it. And that became mail order monsters. And so after that, the industry crashed and um, one of the famous crashes. And so Evan and Nikki and I are like, oh, geez, what are we going to do? Uh, let's make a really like safe game. And so that's how we ended up doing the golf game. And um, you can kind of see how we struggled with that by virtue of the fact that there's a dinosaur in there. Uh, which they didn't want, but I thought, if you want to put a dinosaur in your golf course, by God, you should be able to. And he'll eat your ball. That's what'll happen. So, and after that, uh, I, at that point, I wanted to, to head out, and I was able to meet with Fred. Um, he had been, well, how, what, how, what were you up to in that period of time? Well, while he was at TSR, I was actually making uh, video games for Japanese personal computers in the early 80s, and... Uh, and then that was while I was still going to college. Uh, that company went out of business, and uh, I ended up in the corporate world for a while programming. And I got when I got sick of that is when I when Paul and I got together. 
And uh, fortunately, actually, Errol and Robert Leyland were involved in the company that Fred was working with, so they were able to connect the two of us. And it was just a really awesome timing because we both were really ready to tackle something new and we had the time. Um, one of the things that I think made Star Control different was we just sort of stopped talking with the publisher about what we were doing. Um, they stopped paying us, which was fair enough. But <laughs> So Fred floated the company for a few months. But really, we just made the game we wanted to make. And um, eventually, when we were done, they published it. So it's really hard to o overestimate how important that is. Yeah, I know you had mentioned uh, that, which surprised me, that apparently uh, you wanted Mail Order Monsters was supposed to be a serious, I guess, a serious and gritty game. And uh, you know, this sort of guy. Well, a little more. You know, we had this vision in our head of giant monsters and you know you're in the future and genetically engineering these creatures and then that was in our heads and then when you actually looked at the game there's like little kind of semi-cute monsters and so you don't always control the perception you create just the materials that's going to create that perception and what we had to do is realize that we had a successful experience it just wasn't necessarily the one that we had in our heads and so eventually we embraced this more robust sort of actually kind of gamma world like relationship with the the fiction which was really having fun with it and embracing it at the same time and once we did that everything went great and Errol is famous for um, at least with me for helping me with the shine on the worm creature the worm body type in that and I, I think we specifically credit him at some point with worm <laughs> shine by Errol <laughs> alright well toys for Bob then how did, how did that come about I'm sort of curious how you, uh, the name of it, you know, how did that come about? I'm glad you asked that because I'm looking at you, Lori, my wife. Um, Lori, uh, we were looking for names, and um, Lori recommended Toys for Bob uh, because it was playful and it allowed people to project something of themselves into it. She's a, a poet, so she thinks about words very, very carefully. And it works marvelously well. I can't tell you how many people are desperately want to know the true secret of Toys for Bob. And each of us, the, the kind of the company rule is each of us has to come up with our own Bob and act as though that is the only Bob there is and thus further confuse people. So it's sort of a discordian approach <laughs> to that. <laughs> and somehow we have remained Toys for Bob while being a partnership, being a division within Crystal Dynamics, being a corporation, and then now being a studio within Activision. So somehow we're able to just keep pulling it along with us. My personal Bob is probably the subgenius. What about you, Fred? Well, I would have to go with myself since my, my first <laughs> name is actually Robert. So I go by my middle name to my friends, which is Frederick. And given that we're being funded entirely by Activision and getting tremendous support from their executives on this. Uh, Toys for Bobby Kotick is also not an unreasonable way to look at this. <laughs> All right, so Star Control. Star Control. What's the story uh, of that game? How did it come about? I was kind of curious if you saw this as a, as a progression of some ideas that had started with Archon and uh, Mail Order Monsters. Well... <clears throat> For, I'll speak for myself initially, and the answer is uh, uh, kind of yes, given that the first name was, was Starcon. Um, and, no so, <laughs> and so it was uh, initially I had done a, a fake ad to pitch it, and it was sort of three-dimensional space combat um, with, the, the sort of matching up that we established in Archon of very asymmetrical characters. So this character, I think um, some reviewer coined it as rock, scissors, vapor, which I've always thought was appropriate, where this character is strong against this one, who in turn is strong against this, this one, and hopefully your two different teams match out. But learning about the matchups as well as playing the individual characters really matters. And boy, you'll see that in, I, mean, I don't think 102 Dalmatians strong in that way, but almost all the other ones are. You know, Unholy War, definitely. Star Control, definitely. Um, both one and two. But that was just the starting point. And then, um, I mean, the first game that Fred put together as he was assembling the technology, I keep sort of sliding out of frame, was um, 
just flying spaceships around and blowing up asteroids. Um, and it was a two-player, you know, with the, I think it was the Yehat and the Vux, the Vux ship. And so we started playing the game within a week or two uh, and, and learning how to maneuver and fire weapons. And so that, the whole universe is built upon that play experience. And so in general, we would create a ship through illustrations or, um, and, and usually through paper illustrations and then implement powers that made sense for it and that were cool. And then afterwards, we'd sort of backwards think about, now, who's flying this ship? You know, this ship sort of has this odd robotic kind of pop look to it. So maybe like someone who looks like Devo is flying it. <laughs> and so the Anderson evolved out of this strange, like, wouldn't it be cool if Devo was flying spaceships? <laughs> and then from that, later on in Star Control 2, we created all these very simple visual stories with the captain's images and then the spaceships, and then the loose pairings of the two different sides. So in Star Control 2, we did a lot of just digging ourselves out of this creative narrative hole. We, you know, like, these guys are clones, and here's this evil kind of hierarchically oriented empire, and here's these creatures who are really ugly. What's up with them? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that's, uh, we don't want to reveal all of our secrets, but sometimes the ship designs would drive the story, and sometimes the other way around, too depending on what our needs for this story were. Yeah, so I think like Shimmer ship, that was where we pretty much knew we ha needed to have something that bore a relation to both the, the Shimmer and the Mernherm, or the, sorry, the Chenjesu and Mernherm ships. Uh, and that was, that was illustrated by uh, a, a different guy who we'd hired to do some ship designs. So that looks quite a bit different from like many of the ship designs that Greg or I, Greg Johnson, worked at all levels in and out of it throughout two years. And he did, uh, I think, for example, the Micon ship design, which was so organic, and that led into their whole story about how do you, how do you rationalize this combination of an organic structure with the high energy of plasma? And so that sort of said, well, what about these creatures who live in that kind of molten discontinuity between you know, the interior of the planet and the crust, and then how'd they get there? And man, someone must have made them. You know, Creatures wouldn't evolve there, but if you made a creature to live there, what would it be doing there? And obviously making volcanoes. And so, <laughs> so as I said, my imagination often tells stories all on its own, and I just have to write them down, what I hear in my head. Uh, hopefully the giant floating mask won't, <laughs> won't start telling me to kill again, but uh, beyond I think it's a worthwhile uh, talent. So, Paul, you have a special love, I know, for the, for the spathy. You want to talk about that a little bit? Well, love, uh, yeah, they're, they're to a large extent me, the distilled sense of my philosophy involving self-preservation <laughs> at all costs. Um, Fred and I were once talking over lunch about, you know, what if we were rich? What would you do? And I started talking about, well, I'd really like a house out in the woods, this beautiful house, you know, but, but the woods have, you know, scary things, bears and monsters. And so while I would want to take walks, you would want to know you had walls sufficient to keep out the very scary monsters, but the monsters being tricky, um, would get over those walls from time to time and you would need backup plans. And I like to climb trees, so I thought, well, if we, if we sort of tailor the trees to my climbing abilities, you know, monsters are heavy, they won't be able to like stand on the limbs that I can climb up on. And then, if a monster is sitting at the bottom of the tree, unless I've carefully structured like rounds of guards who are monster capable, well, that monster is going to be down there for a while unless I get rid of him. So having rocks stored in each of these treetops of sufficient size for my flimsy arms to throw them, and yet big enough to annoy a monster so that he would go away. So all I really had to do was take <laughs> this fantasy that I've been telling to Fred over Chinese food and give it to this crazy alien. And then everybody like, oh, yeah, it's a crazy alien. But, but so running away and throwing rocks has been one of my strategies extrapolated in all ways. I'm the Sun Tzu of running away and throwing rocks. So uh, the Spathy are, to a large extent, just me. Uh, and uh, then also, you know, the, the other folks who sort of chipped in and helped create their culture and the idea of the safe ones who, they're sort of the more safe and the further back you are from trouble, you know, the more uh, high in the hierarchy you are. So Fred, do you have a special place in your heart for a particular alien? 
Uh, well, I, I would say that probably none of the aliens represents me <laughs> perfectly, but uh, I do like uh, I I like how extreme the Ilrath and the Druge are uh, in their various ex- extremes. They're very passionate. <laughs> I drew uh, the Starbase captain after sitting next to Fred. I, I think he knows that, but uh, so that that's his one of his bits in there. Probably true Starkin fans already know this. But I'll let Fred tell the story as I'm the butt of it. Of the Pekunk? Yeah, the, the insults. Oh, <laughs> uh, the, the ship uh, regenerates energy through insults. Uh, and I, I, that power I gave, I gave to the ship because I, for some reason I don't even remember the roots of it, but I was really mad at Paul <laughs> one day and uh, d- decided that that was the way that that ship would regenerate its powers. So, Fred, we just recorded him, basically, with a string of insults focused at me. And it both, <laughs> it both soothed the situation and uh, derived the reason why. We were like, why are these guys who are so philosophical and sort of, um, you know, magical and crystal energy, why do they insult people? And then the whole idea of being too nice and it wrapping around and you getting really, really evil, that, like, your morality was assigned value, uh, started to really appeal to us. <laughs> so we like the idea that never be too good. Always, you know, minor insults and pinch people when they're not looking, and that'll keep you safe. Yeah, that has to be a, a totally unique story of game design. <laughs> <laughs> never heard anything like that. Well, that's why I still screw up and do stupid things, because I want to motivate Fred to do his best. <laughs> Tell me about the uh, the music of Star Control 2, because I know there's a... Pretty interesting story behind that. <laughs> I'll let Fred tell that one too. Well, uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, we weren't getting paid towards the end, and we had, even so, we still had a limited budget for uh, to to buy all of the music in our game, and and since we had so many races, and we wanted them each to have an individual piece, and then there were some. There was the, the piece that would play in the solar system and then surrounding planets and in hyperspace. It got to be uh, probably upwards of like 40 themes. Yeah, that's about right. About 40 themes. And we just didn't have money to pay full price for all 40 of them. Uh, and so I think it was Paul's idea <laughs> to uh, hold a contest with uh, a, a decent first prize and then pretty wimpy second prizes. But second, lots of but second lots prizes. Of, 40, of, yeah. 40, I think. What were the prizes? And, uh, money um, like 50, and fame. Yeah, like $50, <laughs> I think. Or $50. Uh, we ended up finding a, a gentleman, uh, uh, Dan Nicholson, uh, who had done one of the really cool themes. And actually, the contest didn't get us all the music we needed. So we pursued with him, um, I think just over email, uh, writing additional music. And it was in this digital multi-track format called Mods that was pretty new, certainly for American games back then. And he had a great talent at doing awesome sort of techno music, which is what I really wanted in a lot of the game. And uh, what we didn't know is I don't think he was 18 yet. He was, he was quite young. But the cool thing about computers is, man, if you've got talent, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter how old you are or where you are. So... Uh, and then we did end up connecting with him later on. He did some work on um, the Horde and the 3DO version of Star Control at Crystal. And then later on, there was the Remix project about five years back, where when Star Control was released as open source, uh, Riku Nwadajarvi and Dan and a couple of the other guys remixed their music, um, <laughs> not in four track, 64 kilobyte uh, mod files, but in full Redbook audio. It was beautiful stuff. You know, you had mentioned the uh, the open source version. I was wondering how you how you feel about that. Well, we actually released it, so um, we we feel bad that we haven't ever made it back to to make a sequel yet. And we thought that the least we could do was uh, release the source code to the fans to, and let them revive it on modern computers, since it didn't really work well once Windows became ubiquitous. Yeah, and I mean, I think some people have made their own extensions of it. And our policy has always been, do whatever you want with it, as long as you don't turn any of our characters into mass murderers. Or if you make money, let's talk, you know, because if you're making money off our stuff, then, you know, we'd like a pizza, at least. Um, But uh, so 
<laughs> pizza is a good unit of exchange. Um, and uh, so there's been, gosh, the game's been ported to a whole bunch of different platforms. I know versions of it exist on the, the Mac OS devices, you know, the, the iPad and the iPhone. I don't think I've actually played one yet, but I do know they're out there. Um, I do know that someone online is using some of our art, but uh, I can't track him down. So he's, I'm going to get him one of these days. <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the third and final part of my interview with Paul Ritchie and Fred Ford. A lot of great content coming up, so stay tuned. also want to thank everyone who has been donating to uh, support the show and keep the drinking horn happy. I'll be drinking a toast later tonight to my good friend Laffer. And Laffer, I will be toasting you with a Tommyknocker, Jack Whacker, Weed Ale, a breed... <laughs> Brewed in Idaho Springs, Colorado. Heard some very good things about it. I'm looking forward to it. And I'll be thinking of you as I do. Now, as I want to do, I thought I would leave you with a quotation. This time from our good friend Orson Scott Card. Magnificent author. If you haven't read his book, Ender's Game, I strongly suggest you order that immediately from Amazon. <laughs> or check it out at the library. Guarantee you will not be displeased. Here's the quotation. Everybody dies. What matters is what you do between now and when it happens to you. One of the things I plan to do is enjoy my Jack Whacker. <laughs> See you guys next week.